This wasn't pre-planned this morning, but the passage that uh, Connie just read is very fitting because I have to imagine as we dig into the book of Jeremiah that he had to be asking some of those or having some of those same thoughts about, you know, God, where are you, where are you, you know, why are you not doing, um, in his perspective, could have easily said, where, where are you in this? So, uh, just, and yet through the story of Jeremiah, we see someone who remembered and recognized God at work, even when the fruit that we might think of wasn't as apparent as what we see in other places. So the book of Jeremiah is just a fascinating, a fascinating story. And uh, so we are going to focus kind of, we're going to be up around the book a little bit, but focus a little bit on chapters 15 and 16. So let's, before we do that, remember again this year we have spent the last almost nine months now, eight months, you're finishing up the eighth month of, of digging thing and going through scriptures. And so we have those miracles and workings of old that Connie read in Psalms. We've read through those this year again about the work and the exodus and the creation and all of that. And, and so all of the works that he's been doing through, other, through all of these uh, writers and through his people. So what we need to remember was that when God developed the nation of Israel, there were 12 tribes. Now, thinking back throughout the course of history, they got to a place where they didn't like the way the leading was being done, and so they went to God and said, we want a king. We want to be like every other nation, which really flew in the face of what God had desired and designed them to be. He had designed them to be holy, to be set apart, to be different than every other nation around them. And yet, that is what they wanted. So we have three kings during that time. We have King Saul, King David, and then David's son, Solomon. Now, after Solomon died, as you have no doubt read this year, the, the kingdom split. We end up with the story of Jeroboam and Rehoboam that's found in 1 Kings chapter 11 through 14. So I'd encourage you at some point, if you want to refresh that story, back in 1 Kings 11 through 14. And it's a fascinating story. It's a story that probably resonates pretty well with how we tend to see leadership grabs or power grabs being done even in this day. It's a story of power and money and rebellion, again, that is unfortunately leveraging in so many cases of leadership transition. And during this time, the people were, tr were divided into two, two nations, if you will. You had the northern kingdom, two kingdoms. Two, the northern kingdom had ten of the twelve tribes, and they were led by Jeroboam, and the other two followed Rehoboam in what we, we refer to as Judah. Now, throughout all of their history, and you've seen it over and over and over again as you've read through the Old Testament, God repeatedly has warned them to stop in their idolatrous behavior. But they continue to ignore him whenever it, it, it benefits their desires to do so. And so finally he tore these 12 tribes apart into the northern and southern tribes. And the northern tribes get taken into captivity by the Assyrians. And so what we see in there is that even God's long-suffering patience has an end. And we'd be remiss to think that that's any different with us today. Now one thing you may or may not be aware of, but I'm going to share this either way, is that it's important to know that when you look at the prophetic books as they're listed, they are not in order that they were written. So don't look at them and say, well, first was Isaiah, then was Jeremiah. And so they were divided by major and minor prophets. So that is very important. So you don't say, well, what was going on in Isaiah's day? Now what's going on now? And think that it's going to be chronologically ordered. That's, that is an important thing to know. In fact, here we have Jeremiah as the second prophetic book, but he's actually the last prophet that God sent to Judah. 
And so even though we, we will eventually get into these minor prophets, and they are minor only because of the length with which they were written. In fact, when we get there, I'm excited about preaching on some of those in particular because there's some very significant messages and material in the minor prophets that are kind of those small books at the end of the Old Testament that we may kind of skip past to get to the gospel a lot of times or to the, to the New Testament gospel writings. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet in the final days of this nation that is crumbling. As I've already alluded to, he was the last prophet sent to the southern kingdom. The two tribes that were a part of it were Judah and Benjamin. Now, God had given the Israelites so many warnings and more than enough time to turn back to him, but God sent Jeremiah to give Judah one last warning before he would send them into the land, out of the land, decimating the nation, sending them into captivity in this pagan kingdom. Now Jeremiah, who was a faithful, God-fearing man, he was called to tell them that because of their unrepentant sin, that God had turned against them and was now prepared to remove them from this land and to give them over to the pagan kings, whom he actually refers to, God refers to them as my servant. Now, no doubt, Jeremiah, who was only about the age of 17 when God called him, he had some very inner turmoil. Imagine if someone came to you and said, you know what, your pe God came to you and said, your people group, the people, you know, First Baptist Church, they're going into captivity if they don't listen. You know, they've been unrepentant, they've, been, they've just disregarded God's message, and I'm, I've had it. And now is the day that, it's, that my uh, long, enduring, long suffering patience runs out. He no doubt wanted to run and go to them and tell them, I mean, weep with them and just and do everything that he could to help them have a change of heart. Now, Jeremiah is often referred to as the weeping prophet because he cried tears of sadness not only because of what was going to happen, but because no matter how hard he tried, God had already told him the people would not listen. Even before he started to prophesy. Can you imagine how Jeremiah must have felt? In a very, very small way, it would be as though me getting up here and saying, you know what, I've been called to preach here every Sunday, and God's, God makes it, you know, if God were to tell me, you know what, nobody's going to listen, nobody's going to heed your call, nobody's going to change, nobody's going to take the advice and wisdom to get into the Word and dedicate and meditate on the Word, memorize Scripture, nobody's going to listen. And if God said, you know what, no one's going to listen, but you need to do it. It is about your obedience. Let God take care of the fruits. It'd be pretty tough, wouldn't it? Or if you were in your place of business or raising kids and, and you said, keep doing what you need to do, but they're not going to listen anyway. Leave you a lot of... <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's, that's good. So, um, God called him to warn the people while simultaneously telling him that they would not listen. He understood, Jeremiah understood, that the only response to a loving and just God was total obedience. It wasn't about what he was going to get out of it, but what God had called him to do. So regardless of what is going on around you today, regardless of maybe how you've been hurt, how other people have hurt you, what they've done to you, whatever is in your past, it is so important to remember to trust always in the faithfulness of God. And so my sermon in a sentence this week is this, and so this is my summary statement for the message. It's, it seems that the devil's schemes to take apart the world at its seams is working. But take heart, because in the end, 
Christ wins. I'll tell you what, I don't hear too many things from people more than I hear about this sense of hopelessness that they see in our world, whether it be the things that we see going on overseas or whether it be things that are going on in our very land or in our communities, there is a sense like, what's going on here? And at the same time, I see this growing sense of God is at work and the end is drawing near. Take hope, before we really dig into today's message, take hope that we know the end of the story. And that regardless of what we will face, no, regardless of what, what wins it seems that Satan is making in this day, know that God will triumph over all. Now, consider yourself back in Jeremiah's shoes for just a minute. He's just been told by God, or his sandals, I guess, God, he's just been told by God that no one's going to listen to him. So that's like, okay, you know, my job in a sense, my calling is going to really bear no fruit. But it doesn't just stop there. He also really had no human comfort because in chapter 16, verse 2, we, we read that God had forbidden Jeremiah to marry or to have children. We also know from the story that his friends had turned their backs on him. So not only did he have this unbelievable responsibility of having to, to share the impending judgment that was coming, he couldn't just end the day and go home to the comfort of a wife and kids. So he had to be incredibly, incredibly lonely in the midst of the message that he was called to give. Now God knew that this was the best course for Jeremiah. Because he told them that in the long run, the, hor the horrible conditions that would be in place for babies, children, and adults, that they would die grievous deaths, their bodies would be unable to be buried, and their flesh would be devoured by the birds. Those words that I just read are immediately following his command not to marry or have kids. So God is saying, here's the reason why. Now obviously the people of Israel had been affected and been hardened, their hearts had been hardened by the numbing effects of no longer believing in God. They didn't fear him. Now if you've ever been around people that don't fear God, don't know God, you understand it's just kind of this numbing sense of like, it doesn't matter what you say. They have an answer for it. They have a reason not to accept it. There's a spiritual, that numbness that we might say, that's a spiritual blindness to God's presence. Jeremiah preached for 40 years. So I got a lot of time still ahead of me here to get there. But not once did he see any real success or change in the softening of hearts and minds of his people. They were stubborn. They were idolatrous. They had no room in their hearts for God's truth through Jeremiah. Now the other prophets all experienced at least periods of time where they, they experienced what we would call some success, if you will. At least for a short period of time. The turning back for a window of life, but not Jeremiah. It was as though he was speaking to a brick wall. But know that his words were not wasted. They were like, Jesus would go on in the sense that they, they were pearls, they were pearls being cast before swine. They were convicting the people, this is the truth, and yet they still refused to hear them. The problem isn't with the message, it's with our hearts. Now, Jeremiah tried to make the people understand that their problem was a lack of belief, trust, and faith in God, along with this absence of fear, which caused them to take God for granted. How many of you can relate to that? Have you, how many of you have had experiences and times in your life where it becomes very difficult 
to, uh, to really understand who God is and that it's really easy to take him for granted. Hey, God, I need this. Do this for me, please. If it's not too much to ask, do this, this, and this, too. So they're, and, and so they've been going through this generation of, of sense, as we've read over and over throughout scriptures. And it's very easy to be lulled into a false sense of security, especially when our focus is not on God. Now the nation of Israel, just like many nations today, had stopped putting God first. They replaced him with the false gods, knowing that they would not make them feel guilty, and they certainly would not convict them of their sin. We are seeing that show up in this day, even within some of the bodies of faith that are saying, you know, we don't need to deal with your sin. That's not the issue. Don't worry about that. That there are other avenues, that it isn't about that. So even in this time, we have these wolves that are in sheep's clothing amongst the presence of even the Western church. Now remember those old stories, as Connie read in Psalms, the, the story of God delivering his people from bondage in, in Egypt. He had performed many miracles that they had witnessed firsthand. He parted the seas for them twice. And in spite of all of the displays of God's power, they returned to the false practices they had learned in Egypt. Even making vows, as we read in, in uh, Jeremiah 44, they had given, uh, they were um, making vows to this false queen of, of heaven, is what it's referred to. They were performing rites and rituals that were part of Egyptian culture and religion. So even after all this time, you know, God had called them out of the old, into the new, and yet they were still held captive in a way to the old. Doesn't that sound just like Paul's writings? You must die to your old self. Put on the new self. Let your, let your past ways die. Kill them off. Because they're there wanting to, it, your old self is wanting to pull you back into the ways that you have been enslaved before you had a relationship with Jesus. So God finally turns them over to their idolatry. And in Jeremiah 44, verse 25, this is what he said. He says, go ahead, do what you promised. Keep your vows. Let me read that again, because it references very closely to a passage I've quoted a number of times since I've been here. He says to the Jewish or to the people in Judah, go ahead then. Do what you promised. Keep your vows. Sounds a lot like Romans chapter one. God is turning them, he's saying, go ahead. You vowed that you will not be faithful to me, so here you go. They were experiencing what God does sometimes, and he says, I'm going to give you the freedom, the space, to see what the fallout is about what you wanted. I want you people who will not turn your hearts, that are hardened to me, I want you to finally experience what it means to live outside of my authority. I want you to see what it looks like, how great it is out there. God is just turning them over to their depraved minds. He's giving the people, he's allowing the people what they want for that season of time. And he already told Jeremiah what was going to happen. Things are going to be so awful that it would be better off if you just didn't have a wife and kids. Because you don't want to go through that pain of what's going to happen and what you're going to see around you. This isn't even our first story that we've encountered with regards to some of the trials that the nation went through. Remember the time where we read about the, the women that were, that were 
that had come up with an agreement to sacrifice their kids because they were running out of food. So these were, they had been through some very dire things that God had miraculously brought them through. Remember, they go out of the camp, four of those guys go out of camp, and there's no one there. The enemy all fled because of Jesus or because of God's, God's power in that presence. So even after all of these things, they still can't change. Now, Jeremiah's constant loneliness and his isolation finally get the best of him. And it, we read later on that he became discouraged. I mean, who, who amongst us wouldn't, right? I know I would get discouraged if year after year, week, you know, week after week, year after year, nobody was listening. There was no change of heart. It's just, you know, what I was 20 years ago is what I am still today. He sank into a quagmire where many believers get stuck even today. Where they think, well, my effort isn't making a difference and my time is ticking away. He was emotionally spent even to the point, as we read in Jeremiah 15, verse 18, that he doubts God. But God was not done with him at that point. So, remember now, verse 18 of chapter 15, we get, he is doubting God. Next verse says that it records a lesson for each believer to remember in those times when you feel alone, or when you feel useless, or when you feel discouraged, or when your faith is wavering. Verse 19 says, Therefore, this is what the Lord says, If you repent, I will restore you that you may serve me. If you utter worthy, not worthless words, you will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. God was saying to Jeremiah, stop for a minute. You're getting discouraged because what's going on out there. Don't let that be your primary focus. Your primary focus, as it ought to be for each of us, is to return back to God, to draw closer to our Creator and Savior. He tells him that he will restore, not only that, he will restore the joy of his salvation. And they are very similar words to which God wrote to David, or through David, when he repented of his sin with Bathsheba, back in Psalm 51. And so what we learn from the life of Jeremiah is the comfort of knowing that just like every believer, even the great prophets, even those individuals who we might tend to say, we couldn't be like them. These guys, you know, these guys that are in the Bible that God used, I'm not like them. We get, we get into that mindset that somehow they are worthier than we were, they were holier than we were. But they experienced rejection, depression, and discouragement in their walks as well. This is a natural part of growing spiritually. Because our sinful nature is fighting against this new nature that God offers to us. It's fighting tooth and nail because it does not, Satan does not want to lose what he had had. We are born of the Spirit when we know Christ. We have a new nature. We must live in that new nature. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 17, for the sinful nature that is contrary to the, is, is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict. If you've ever felt conflicted, and I know we all have, we have times of conflict. It's because of this conflict. It's the conflict between spirit and our own sinful nature. But just as Jeremiah found, we can find that the faithfulness of God is infinite. And so that even when we are unfaithful to him, he remains steadfast. Jeremiah, as I said, was given the, this responsibility of delivering an unpopular, convicting message to Israel. 
one that caused him this mental anguish, and it made him despised amongst his people. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he tells us, God tells us that his, that truth, God's truth will sound like foolishness to those who are lost. But to the believer, they are the very words of life. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, we read that there will also be a time that would come where truth would not be tolerated. We are seeing that time play out as, we are stand, as I'm standing here and you're sitting here right now. Where do you find your truth? For morality, sexuality, the source of your identity, the value of life, and through where eternal things are found. The overwhelming majority, and I'm not understating this, the overwhelming majority of people, based on their actions, reflect that they trust the cultural norms, the things of the world, the things of the old flesh, over God. And perhaps maybe not any more so than in with regard to the areas of sexuality. The full I mean you could break touch the whole gamut, I'm not going to this morning, but what you see through all of this is that even believers, many believers, have taken a drastic change in what does, what does God desire from us in the way of sexuality? What does that look like? How, do, how does one stay pure in that way as God has commanded us? There's been a seismic shift in our culture in many of these areas that I, asked, or just, I just mentioned here. And every time that we as people shift our trust from God onto idols, what we see is the depth of the depravity of man. And again, as I've said multiple times in weeks prior, that not only can man not acknowledge the truth when they are depraved, they run faster in the direction of the perverse behavior. And not even that, they also encourage others to join in with them. Where is your source of truth? Is it the word? You know, is it, is it, well, I, I see things posted or I had some conversations or, you know, this is what so-and-so told me. This is, you know, what, what, where is your foundation for these things? I'm not telling you, I'm not asking you to get up after the service and talk to me about what you believe. I want to see, I want to know in your actions, what does that mean? What does it mean to live a morally, as morally pure as we can? Yes, we are sinful. But how does one, a story that I remember hearing years ago, was about a guy who, and I think I shared this one Sunday earlier last fall, a, ma a student who had successfully passed an ethics class. He had an A in math. He'd gotten every question right in the entire class. And he was standing in line at the lunch in the cafeteria, and uh, there was packets of condiments sitting out by the cash register, and they were for a dime. They, had to, they needed to pay for them. And he took a couple of them and stuck them in his pocket, not knowing, not that it should have mattered, but not knowing that the individual behind him in line was his professor. And his professor said to him afterwards, I failed you in the class because of that. That's what I'm talking about. And we all have that. We all have inconsistencies in our life because we are human. But it's when those things happen, it's what do we do about them? Do we repent from them? Do we turn from them? Do we remember that we are to be set apart? It doesn't matter what people out there believe or do or act. That should not impact what you do how you speak, how you go about your life. Go back to the Word. We are not to be like the fool who repeats his folly. Or in one of my favorite graphic verses in Scripture, we're not to be like the dog who returns to 
to his vomit. That's not on the menu I hope downstairs. <laughs> so just as Jeremiah begged his people to listen, I urge you to hear the words of the Apostle Paul as we seek to understand transformation that God offers to each of us who are saved. See, we live in a day where even churches are divided against one another and people against others. And I'm going to read this. This is actually a part of the text I used the first Sunday that I was here last August. Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge and the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all the wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Now those in, in Jeremiah's day didn't want to hear this. He didn't want to hear, hear what he had to say about his constant warning of judgment that annoyed them. And this is true of our world today. Even though people are not listening, we must persevere in proclaiming the truth. Because our, 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 our goal is to, is to, is to um, rescue some of them from the terrible judgment that will inevitably come. It's coming. Hebrews chapter 10 says, Let us not waver in the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us not forget how we, may how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as the day is approaching. The day of Christ is approaching fast. We are seeing end times prophecies being fulfilled in real time. But we don't have to only rely upon the things here and now. We rely, as, as people in Christ, we rely on those who have come before us. As I've heard someone here say, we stand on the shoulders of those of faith who have come before us. Hebrews chapter 12. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. So throw off everything that hinders 
and that sin so eagerly entangles. Run this race with perseverance that was marked out. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. Make sure you are right with the Father. I want to close this morning with something that I think is probably on the hearts and minds of many of you. I've heard it from a handful of you over the last, well, it's been probably almost a year. And it's recognize that the days to come for the believer are going to be more difficult in this country. In the meantime, rededicate yourself to the local church body. For most of our lives, let me pause and say, hear this. Hear this word because we have lived in a, in a society where it's been really easy to allow our faith to be, well, we gather together on Sunday, but after that it's just about me. And hey, if I need prayer, then I'll come to you, or if I need this or that. But there will be a day where that changes. For most of our lives, for my entire life, much of the church in this country has been able to, to get by, if you will, not having to rely on the one another's. We can make it work for the most part. We don't have to worry in many cases about the day-to-day -day needs, although that sometimes happens. But their writing is on the wall. A day is fast approaching where it will be more vital for us to rely upon each other, even for those daily needs. So that adds just one more layer to what I'm talking about when we talk about the importance of these growth groups, small groups, the need to have one another, to strengthen one another, to encourage one another, to pray for one another, to grow our faith together. Because by the time that, that these, these times come, that I, that I am not, and I'm not the first one that you've heard it from, no doubt, when, as, as these challenging days become more and more real, you're going to find real quickly it's too late. We found that out a year, and a, a year ago where, you know, it was like, and for a season of time, this is just the building, but the churches were, were shut down like that. We're seeing stuff happen all over, even in the Western Hemisphere. More and more growth in that direction. So love one another. This is, this is your family. This is the family that God has placed you with. The brothers and sisters who have that are journeying through the same struggles that you are, that need much of the same things that you need, that have placed their hope in Christ. And I love my earthly family, but there's nothing more beautiful than the family that God has given us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, we, we acknowledge that we often are, are living moment to moment and, and living in what we can see, which is just a snippet of time, Lord. We can't even perceive the things that will happen this afternoon or tomorrow, Lord. Things can happen so quickly, but nothing is outside of your, your realm of control and outside of, of what you know, Lord. We know that you know the end from the beginning and that you have our best interests in mind. Lord, as we, as we battle with the things that we face each day, the trials that are presented to us, Lord, help us to run that race well. Help us to rely upon one another. Lord, I ask you to tear down this mindset that we are burdening one another by asking them for assistance. Lord, we are to be a fellowship of believers who reach out and care and love for one and love each other. Lord, just as you have loved us, you longed when you were, when you were praying in the garden, you longed that, the, that God would make the church 
have the relationship, the unity that you have with the Father. Lord, you have blessed us in so many ways here at First Baptist Church. Lord, help us to be a blessing out of the overabundance of grace and mercy and love that you have shown each one of us here. In your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the benediction and remember again, there's food downstairs. Come on down and eat. And I think, I didn't do it last time because it took me so long to get downstairs. I think I'm going to, uh, I'll, I'll do the benediction and I may just do a brief prayer for the food. That way you guys can feel so let to just go and eat because by the time I get down there, everything might be cold. So uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and to be gracious to you. May he give you peace in your going out and your coming in as you lie down and as you rise up in the morning in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until you come to stand before Jesus that day where there will be no sunset or dawning. Amen. Let me just, I'll pray for the food too and then we'll have a closing. And Lord, we just thank you for the bountiful blessings that you have provided to us uh, for the abundance, the overabundance of food that we often have in this country. Lord, we are, are so thankful for what we have, Lord, and the opportunity to share and fellowship together. We bless this food to each body and the fellowship that we have together. Amen.